All right, we are in Acts chapter 10. As we go through our, our verse by verse. And actually, I'm going to start in Deuteronomy. Uh, I'm going to read a verse there, a couple verses before we actually get the... But in, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, because I want you to get the mindset of the Israelites, or in this case, the Jewish people at this time. And you have to remember that as we're in, in Acts chapter 10, we're actually about 10 years from Pentecost. So a lot of times we read through Acts, we think, well, this happened last week and this happened the next month. But well, this is over a time period. And like I say, we get to chapter 10, we're about 10 years, 10 years into the, uh, since Pentecost, okay? So a lot has, uh, has happened since then. Time has passed. But to get the actual mindset we talked about, you know, before the Deuteronomy 32 concept, uh, verses 7 and 8, where it talks about where uh, Moses, is, that's doing Moses a song, and he says um, that the Lord has, has uh, on the day that he scattered the residents of the earth and put up their boundaries for different nations, and he chose Israel, he chose Jacob as his own. Okay, so this is a very similar verse uh, in chapter 7, I'm just going to read verses 6 uh, through 8. And it says, For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the people on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasure possession. Now the Lord did not set his affection on you, and choose you because you were more numerous than the other people, for you were the fewest of all. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. But focus on that, that the Lord your God has chosen you out of all the people on the face of of the earth to be his treasure possession. So what do you think that that causes to happen within a person? I can think of a couple of different things. I can think of, of gratitude would be one, positive, but I also can think of some negative things. So it would be like us saying, okay, Church on the Rock, Harrisonville, you are chosen out of all the people in all the earth, only you. I think it'd be pride would be one thing, right? And uh, probably arrogance and looking down on other groups because they are lesser than. Because as the Lord said in this case, the Lord has chosen you out of all the peoples of the earth. And so if you begin to get that attitude, then what's the reaction from the rest of the people? So think of that mindset, okay? So this is clear back in Deuteronomy where the Lord chose his chosen people. The rest of the nations were left out of this, okay? So there is a, there is a, a mindset that's coming uh, from the, I you know, would say Israelites, but really Jewish people at this time because we're, the other ten tribes of the northern kingdom are, are long gone. And... So that's their mindset. So when you come to chapter 10, this is a huge, um, a huge paradigm shift in their thinking. Because up to now, they've been thinking about themselves, pretty much about ourselves. You know, it's all about us. It's all about this people. But when we get to chapter 10, it's like the Lord interrupts. But at the same time, it shouldn't be something new. Because already in the book of Acts, we've had where, uh, well, going back to the gospel, we had Jesus went to, to the centurion who was a Gentile and healed his servant. We had uh, him going to Samaria and the woman at the well, okay? 
and ministering to that whole village. So the uh, Syrophoenician woman whose daughter had a demon, and he healed that, that daughter. And so we already have up to this point where, where Jesus ministered to Gentiles, okay, even though he said first to the Jew and then to the Gentiles. But then we had Philip who went to uh, Samaria and how he uh, ministered there and Peter and John then followed up and went to check it out and they found, yeah, the Lord is uh, bringing in the Gentiles also. So it's not like this should be such a shock or even in a, in a way to me, it seems about even to me need to be done what happens in, in chapter 10. But it does. And I would like to say that, well, after chapter 10, then that entered, the, you know, we're not going to have that issue anymore. But that's not the case because they still had that issue even later on in the early church. So we're going to go ahead, go back to Acts chapter 10. And again, like I say, we're about 10 years in from the day of Pentecost. We're verse 1, and it says, At Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. Okay, so Caesarea uh, was predominantly a Roman city. It sets right on the... Mediterranean Sea there. Back when I was there visiting that, uh, I've got several pictures and they've got several runes there in Caesarea, Roman runes. Uh, and Cornelius is a centurion, it says. So in other words, he's over a hundred soldiers. So in the Roman army, you had uh, divided up into uh, a centurion who's over a hundred. Then you had a cohort, which is the next step, which is made up of 600, and then a legion was made up of 10 cohorts. So you had 6,000 men in the legion, okay? So he's actually from Rome, or from Italy. So he's been to Rome, uh, because many times the, the Romans would also have different uh, nations that they conquered, that they would have legions that were made up, say, of Greece or Macedonia, whatever. They would have, but this was an Italian actually from the Roman city. So it's a predominantly Roman city. And this guy, verse 2, it says, He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. So he was a devout man. He feared God. Now, he had not converted to Judaism. Uh, he hadn't become a, a proselyte, but he believed in the Jewish God. Now, he had also, uh, obviously because he started seeking the Lord, the true Yahweh, he had rejected all the Pathion's gods of Rome. You know, they had Zeus and Hermes, all these different gods, plus even Caesar, many times was worship. So he had rejected that. So he's definitely a truth seeker. He knows what's false. And so he, he's seeking. Now, he couldn't go to the synagogue or to the temple because that would be offensive to the, to the Jews because he was, you know, he was not a proselyte. So we'll pick it up in verse 3 and 4. It says, on that day, about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? The angel answered, your prayers and your gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. So even though he was not yet a believer in Jesus, he 
have been faithful in praying and giving alms and even giving money to the Jewish synagogue, help building those things. Uh, and sometimes we think, well, God doesn't hear the prayers of an unbeliever. But if they're sincerely seeking truth, if they're sincerely seeking the Lord, he hears their prayers. And in this case, he was, he was faithful to answer his prayers. Verse 5 and 6, it says, Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. A lot of Simons in there. So he tells him, the angel tells him to send men to Joppa. And that's about 31 miles down the coast from Caesarea, south. So it's a, it's a ways, especially in those days. You either walked or you rode a donkey or a horse or something. So it's, a, it's quite a trip down there. But it's interesting that the, the angel didn't preach the gospel to him, right? <clears throat> Just like Philip, when he went to Samaria, and the angel told him, you know, go, go up to the, the chariot of the eunuch from Ethiopia. He leaves that for us humanoids, you know, that, that's our job. So the angels are messengers. That's what angel means. They're messengers. They're sent, sent by the Lord. But we have our place to actually be the ones who evangelize and speak the gospel, the truth of the gospel. So in verse uh, 7 and 8, he says, When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened, and he sent them to Joppa. So Cornelius, he immediately obeys, and he sends a servant, a soldier, to Joppa. There was no hesitation at all on his part. Now, verse 9 said, About noon the following day, they were on their journey and approaching the city. Now, Peter went up to the roof to pray. And I want you to kind of keep this in mind, that, that for a religious, pious Jew to have an interaction with a Gentile was an ono. You just don't do that, okay, because they're unclean. In verse 10, he became hungry and he wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. Now, that word trance is very interesting because it, it's uh, in the Greek Septuagint, the, the Greek Old Testament. There's only two instances where that happened. One is in uh, Genesis 2. Uh, we won't turn there, but verse 21. And also in Genesis 15, verses 12, where uh, and the word trance actually means uh, is going into a deep sleep, a visionary deep sleep. So, and then they in that they have a vision, but it's different than just having a vision. Okay, and for a Jewish believer, they would associate this trance with what happened in the Old Testament of those two instances in Genesis where. They fell into a trance, and it was a major thing. And in Abraham's case, it was where uh, he, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. So their minds would have been reflecting back on what happened before. So mentally, they would connect those two events. So he has this, he falls into a trance. And then verse 11 He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth, the birds of the air, and then a voice told him 
Get up, Peter, and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. And the voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. Now this happened three times, and immediately this sheet was taken back to heaven. So he has this vision of this sheet coming down with all sorts of different animals, unclean animals that as a Jew you are not supposed to eat, okay? And Peter says, I have never eaten any of those things. And he says, don't call anything unpure that I have not, that I'm calling. In fact, he should already had a, 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 um, a thought about this back into what Jesus said. Uh, in fact, let me turn there. Mark chapter 7. Turn there real quick. Mark chapter 7. And... Verse 14, and it says, And again, Jesus called to the crowd, and he said to them, Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make a man unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what comes out of a man that makes him unclean. After he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about this parable. Are you so dull, he asked, don't you see that nothing that enters a man from the outside can make him unclean? For it doesn't go into his heart, but into his stomach, and then out of his body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. He went on, what comes out of a man is what makes him unclean. For from from within, out of a man's heart, comes evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malicious, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside, and they make a man unclean unclean. So Peter would have known that. But again, the pressure of generations, hundreds of years of having this mindset, you don't just change that overnight. Because that's what their fathers and their grandfathers and everyone throughout the history of this time followed those rules. The kosher diet. We only eat certain things. We celebrate certain feasts. All those stuff. So this was a major, a major shift in Peter's life. All right, back to 10. So in verse 17, so while Peter was wondering about this, the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. You could actually probably smell it because he was a tanner. If you've ever been in a tanning place, you can smell it a long ways off. They called, they called out asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. Now, while Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you. So get up and go downstairs Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. So, he's had this vision. He's thinking about it. What does all this mean? And it's not just about the food issues. It's about the Gentiles. Because as that perfect timing, that they just happened to come to the door asking for Simon. I'm sure probably the Jews who were there were kind of a little bit, you know, what do you want to see him? What's your business? But Peter comes down and has already been told by the Holy Spirit that there's three men, do not hesitate, but be willing to go with them. So again, it's another confirmation because he had this vision, 
okay? And he has a vision, but then in a trance, a vision, and then yet the Holy Spirit also confirms with him, yes, that you are to do this. And I think many times we need to do that. We need to have confirmation because sometimes maybe we get a prophetic word from someone, you know, see Cammy over there. Let's say Cammy, someone comes up, Cammy says, some young man says, Lord told me I'm going to marry you. And you go, well, that's great, but the Lord hadn't told me that yet, you know. And so we always need confirmation. And it's always think it's interesting that, you know, when, when people get called out so many times, you know, let's say they get called out and said, you're, you know, you're called to ministry. You're going to stand before thousands of people. You're going to have da-da-da-da. No one ever calls out somebody and goes, you know, you're, you're going to have a, a small ministry. You may win one or two people to the Lord during your time. Just be faithful where you're at. No one wants to hear that, right? And no one actually wants to speak that. But probably more often than not, that's actually the truth. Being faithful in the little things. All right, verse 21 through 23. So Peter went down and said to them, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? And the men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. Now he is a righteous and God fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men in to the house to be their guest. Again, this was a big no-no to invite uh, Gentiles into your home to have that interaction with them. So Peter's already getting it and starting to change, okay? Now verse 24 and 26 So the next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and called together his relatives and his close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reference But Peter made him get up, stand up, he said, I am only a man myself. So when Cornelius invites him in, you know, he wants to visit or worship Peter because, you know, he's expecting something great. But at the same time, there's a a great expectation on him of what's going to be happening. And again, if you think back to, you know, the Great Commission, where where Jesus says, you know, first in Jerusalem, then Judea, then in Samaria, then the outermost posts of the world, all, yet they had not done this. Here we're 10 years in, and right now they're still only ministering to Jews, for the most part, even though they've had different things from Isaiah, they've had these things that happened again with Philip in Samaria, and with Jesus in Samaria. It's been a very slow process of, of changing and really going to the Gentiles. Of course, Paul had a big part uh, in that in chapter 9. So they're all there. And he says in uh, verse 27, Peter says, Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or to visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for you, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Okay, so... 
Again, he brings out the point that normally it would be unlawful for him to be visiting a Gentile. And yet, because of this vision, he finally understands and gets it. And I'd like to say again that he got it and this is the end of the issue, but it's, it's not. So in verse 30, Cornelius answered, Four days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said to Cornelius, God, I have heard your prayers and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the house of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything that the Lord has commanded you to tell us. So you talk about an audience who is ready, prepared, and primed to hear the gospel. This was them. So then Peter began to speak. I, need, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Now you know the message of God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. So he preached Jesus, preached Jesus of Nazareth as the Lord and Savior. And he says, we are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Now they killed him by hanging him on a tree. Now it's interesting that, that verse 39 what talks about hanging him on a tree. Think about the correct way that uh, the Jewish people would uh, kill somebody or you know, execute them was by stoning. But in, uh, I'm going to go to Galatians chapter 3 because it's kind of important to know what, it, what Peter's talking about right there. Chapter 3 and verse 14. It says, well, I'll go back to actually 12. The law is, based on, is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed, cursed, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So we are actually, we're under a curse. But he took our curse. Just like he took our sins, he took the curse for us. So that's an important verse as we go back to, to chapter 10, that he was a curse for us. Cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. Obviously, the Romans, that was their way of execution, was by hanging people on a cross. So that has, again, significance. So they killed him, hanging him on a tree, but God raised him from the dead. And on the third day, and caused him to be seen. Now, he was not seen by all the people, but by the witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him, and after he rose from the dead. Now, actually, there were, he's referring to the 12, but actually there, the, the gospel tells us there's over 500 people who saw him after, after his death.
He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one who God appointed as judge of the living and of the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins. So again, he goes on ahead and he's, as he preaches the fullness of the gospel. Unfortunately, he doesn't quite get through his message. He gets interrupted by the Holy Spirit in verse 44. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. So the Jews were astonished because they were seeing the same thing that happened to them, that they received the same Holy Spirit the Gentiles did, as did they. Although, again, this had already happened in Samaria and before. But they were astonished. So they realized, well, I guess this is true. This is also for the Gentiles. Then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So they're baptized. And so he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with him for a few days. So we have this, that again, this astonishment from the Jews that came with Peter, that the Gentiles were also included in this, that they had been uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had fallen on them, and so they're kind of shocked again, even though, again, as we go back, they should have not been shocked because of what has happened in the past already, but they were. And so this began to open up, really, the gospel more to the Gentiles, to all us who weren't Jewish at the time. Now, you would think that after this happened, this would probably be the end of the subject. It's all settled now, no other problems, and we're just going to go smoothly on. We're not going to be dealing with this anymore. But like I said, mindsets of centuries are hard to change. And so we go to, to the book of Galatians, and not just for other Jews, but this is for Peter himself, who just had, you know, he's had this vision, but this is later on in the story. So Galatians chapter, where do I want to go? Here? Galatians chapter 2. In fact, the whole book of Galatians is basically over this issue. But I'm just going to pick out the part about, uh, especially about Peter. But in verse 11 of Galatians chapter 2, so this is Paul speaking, and he says, When Peter came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he was clearly in the wrong. Before certain men came from James, and this is James, the half-brother of uh, Jesus, who was the head of the church in Jerusalem, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those he belonged to the circumcision group. The other Jews joined him in the hypocrisy, so that their hypocrisy, even Barnabas, was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter in front of them all, You are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners know that a man is not justified by observing the law of the Torah, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we, too, have put our faith in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by faith in Christ 
and not by observing the law, because by observing the law, no one will be justified. So Peter, who was living at this time like a Gentile, he wasn't keeping kosher, he wasn't uh, following the, the diet rules, and, and then all of a sudden you had this group that comes, circumcision party, who believed that, uh, and, and so there's a couple different beliefs at this time for the Jewish believers. One was, and it took a long time for this to happen, but where Gentiles were included, and no, they did not need to follow the Torah, they didn't need to follow the dietary laws, they didn't do, you know, it was by faith only. Second group would be a group that would say, yeah, you are saved by faith, but once you are saved by faith, you need to follow, to really be sanctified and really to grow, you need to follow the Jewish customs, you need to follow the dietary laws, and you need to celebrate the, the feast and the holidays, okay? And then a third group has said, you really can't be saved unless you do those things. So there, by this time, there's a couple different views on this. And Peter obviously was influenced by this group that was coming called the Circumcision Party, which would believe that, okay, yes, you may have accepted Jesus, but you need, now that you've done that, you need to follow all the Torah, the different dietary laws, you know, the different feasts, all those things you need to, to do. You need to almost become Jewish. And so Paul confronts him and says, you know, you haven't been living that way, and then all of a sudden now you're changing, and you want these Gentiles now to go back into that? And that's why he's reading that, or writing this whole letter to the Galatians, because this was a huge problem in the Galatians church. And he says, you know, like, who has bewitched you? You started out so well, and now all of a sudden you're going back to the uh, elementary principles. So he says, it's for freedom that God has set you free. Only do not use your freedom as a means for sin. So this was a huge deal in the church. And even though Acts chapter 10 is clearly pointing out with this sheet coming down and showing Peter that, hey, none of this, these things, are, don't call them impure anymore. And then he relates it not only to the food, but to the Gentiles themselves. It still was a problem for many, many years of, of Jewish believers thinking that uh, they should be following the law. And because of that persecution, then again, what reaction that that has, it sometimes results in anti-Semitism. Because you have a natural reaction if someone you feel is persecuting you, that you want to have that same attitude towards them. So this was a, a huge, huge watershed moment in Acts. And even after chapter 15, which is the Council of Jerusalem, where this comes to a head, and they actually get all the, the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, and they make this decision, okay, because... This is going on throughout the Gentile churches. They're being influenced by this. And so they have to have this council and come to a conclusion with James and, and Peter and John and, and the leaders of the church to say, hey, no, they do not have to do this. Well, we'll get to that in chapter, chapter 15. But it, again, it just becomes an issue, and it becomes an issue for many, many years because, it, again, it takes time for people to change when they've had a background of hundreds and hundreds of years of this. Now, there's another thing I'd like to touch on a little bit. Just this, there are some Christians, and, it, and it's a minority, but who believe in a two-covenant theory. In other words, uh, it's through, they would believe that for a Jewish person, they can be saved by following the Torah and not accepting uh, Jesus necessary even as their Messiah. And yet we know that, you know, Jesus says, I am the way, truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through the Son. And again, that's a minority view, but it is out there, just, to, just for you guys to be aware of that. So this is a, a, a huge issue regarding legalism. 
that went on for quite a while. And it was a battle. And so we just need to be aware that sometimes those things happen again in different ways, different influences. But we've got to be aware of the freedom that's by faith in Jesus Christ alone that we are saved. Now, so that's in a chapter 10. Nathan will be starting chapter 11 next week. Uh, there's some things, a lot of prophetic chatter going on right now regarding, uh, you know, we're, we're having this eclipse that come up next month. And hearing different voices and just kind of praying about what's happening, what's going on. Just feel like the next, the next year and a half are, are going to be very, uh, probably troubling times. But at the same time, that's a great opportunity for the gospel to go forward. So I just say that just to be for you guys to be praying about what the Lord may have you do and just to be praying about the circumstances that are going on in the world and in our nation. Now, our, our, how that all turns out, it could be very, at the end of it, that year and a half, it could be very good. But a lot of it will depend upon the church, upon Christians who are praying and interceding, watching. You know, Jesus said so often throughout the, the Old Testament, through the New Testament, you know, watch, watch, pay attention to what's going on, watch and pray. So be praying about things going on, things in the nations and especially in our nation because, you know, our life has been going pretty well, you know. I mean, yeah, there's been there's ripples, but we may be in a time where there's going to be some more severe turbulence that happens. But again, in the end, it can turn out well. But I would just suggest you kind of strap on your seatbelt, be ready, not be shocked. Things start happening. Things start shaking. God's in control. He has a purpose. He has a calling for us. Just be in tune with what the Lord is saying and what the Lord is doing. And not to be uh, into a place of fear. You know, don't let your heart be troubled. Be a point of peace. But use wisdom at the same time. Use situation awareness, what's going on around you. Keep in contact, and especially contact with you and him. Listen to the Holy Spirit, what the Holy Spirit is telling you. All right, let's pray. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth of, of Acts chapter 10, that your word is so deep, so good, Lord. And Lord, just as the, uh, as the New Testament church, that beginning church, struggled with different issues, we should not be shocked that there, there's different opinions and different uh, troubles even within the church. And, and Lord, we just know that, that you are working out your plan, that you're going to bring forth a pure, spotless bride before this thing ends, Lord. So, Lord, we trust you. Lord, we want to open our hearts and our minds to you. We say, come, Holy Spirit. Come, renew our minds by the washing of your word. Lord, change our heart's desires and bring them in line with your will and your word. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you're saying and what you're doing. Lord, we want to line ourselves up with you. And Lord, despite what troubles may be coming, Lord, we trust you. Lord, we know that you are in control, even when it seems like you aren't in control, that you have a plan, you have a purpose, that your ways are higher than our ways. So Lord, again, give us those eyes to see, ears to hear. Lord, stir our hearts, Lord. 
Lord, cause us to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Lord, cause us to see others. Lord, just as we go, as you said, when you go, whether it's to your work, whether you're going to Walmart, whatever it is, that we would have eyes to see others, that we'd be asking you, Lord, do you have something for that person? Is this is someone you want me to minister today? What's in your heart today for me, Lord? That your priorities would be our priorities, Lord. So, Lord, capture our hearts, Lord. Lord, I ask for a burning fire within all of us, Lord. A zeal and a hunger to seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, knowing that all of the things will be added unto us. Lord, we want you. We're hungry and we're thirsty for more of you. We ask for more love, more power, more of you in our lives. Lord, we ask for a greater increase of your anointing, an increase of the gifts of the Spirit, an increase of your authority. Lord, that as we minister to others, we would minister them in the power of the Holy Spirit supernaturally. Stir your church up, Lord. Place a fire of revival in churches all across this town and across this nation, Lord. Let your fire burn, Lord. Awaken a sleepy bride. Cause us to seek the things above and not the things of the earth, Lord. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We exalt you. And we give you the glory, all the glory, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.